Hello, I'm Michael Cho. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at the Channing Division of Network Medicine, the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care Medicine at Brigham and Women's and Harvard Medical School, and I'm here to present the exam questions part one. I have received grant support from GSK for research on COPD. Question one. A 70-year-old woman is admitted to the hospital from home with pneumonia. Her symptoms include fever, cough productive of green sputum, dyspnea, and diarrhea. She is otherwise healthy and takes no medications. On physical exam, her temperature is 101.7 Fahrenheit, heart rate 66 beats per minute, respiratory rate 32 breaths per minute, and blood pressure 88 over 40 millimeters of mercury. Her oxygen saturation is 94% on four liters of oxygen by nasal cannula. Which of the following antibiotic regimens is the best choice for treating this patient? A, azithromycin, B, doxycycline, C, ceftriaxone and azithromycin, D, cefepime and vancomycin, or E, cefepime, vancomycin, and azithromycin. The answer is C. The patient has community-acquired pneumonia that requires hospitalization, potentially in the intensive care unit. In this situation, coverage of typical organisms such as streptococcus pneumonia or haemophilus influenza, and also atypical organisms using an antineumococcal fluoroquinolone or the combination of a beta-lactam plus a macrolide are favored by the ATS and IDSA guidelines and a recent meta-analysis. Azithromycin or doxycycline would be adequate for outpatient treatment. The risk factors that warrant consideration of MRSA include hemodialysis and heart failure, and features of community-acquired MRSA include cavitary and necrotic infiltrates, rapidly increasing effusion, hemoptysis, and rash. Risk factors for antimicrobial resistance include recent hospitalization and antibiotic use. Since this patient has no stated risk factors for MRSA um, or resistant gram-negative bacteria, coverage for these organisms is not indicated. The key point here is to identify appropriate treatment for severe or community-acquired pneumonia. Question two. A 65-year-old man with severe COPD has persistent dyspnea. He is on maximum medical therapy and has completed pulmonary rehabilitation. Which of the following characteristics would predict the greatest benefit from lung volume reduction surgery? A, FEV1 of 25% predicted, DLCO of 30% predicted. Sorry, can I restart? Um, A, FEV1 of 25% predicted, DLCO of 30% predicted, TLC of 150% predicted, maximal exercise of 35 watts and homogeneous emphysema. B, FEV1 of 18%, DLCO of 20%, TLC of 130%, maximal exercise of 35 watts with upper low predominant emphysema. C, FEV1 of 35%, DLCO of 15%, TLC of 110%, maximal exercise of 50 watts, upper low predominant emphysema. D, FEV1 of 40%, DLCO of 30%, TLC of 120%, maximal exercise of 35 watts and upper low predominant emphysema. Or E, FEV1 of 35%, DLCO of 20%, TLC of 90%, maximal exercise of 35 watts and upper low predominant emphysema. The answer is D. The National Emphysema Treatment Trial evaluated the benefit of lung volume reduction surgery in severe COPD with emphysema. Within the initial few months of the trial, an increased risk of death was found for a subgroup of patients with an FEV1 less than 20% predicted and either DLCO of less than 20% predicted or homogeneous emphysema. Overall, the trial found no significant differences in two-year mortality and an improvement in exercise capacity. However, a subgroup analysis identified four groups with varying outcomes. Patients with non-upper lobe predominant emphysema and low exercise capacity, choice A, had only a short-term improvement in exercise. Patients with an upper lobe predominant disease and high exercise capacity, C, had improvements in exercise capacity and quality of life. Patients with upper lobe predominant emphysema and low exercise capacity, D, had these improvements and a reduction in mortality. Patients without hyperinflation, TLC of less than 100% predicted or an RV less than 150% predicted, choice E, were not included in the trial. The key point here is to identify patients that may benefit from lung volume reduction surgery. Question three. A 45-year-old man presents with dyspnea and cough. 
He has had sinus congestion for several months, unresponsive to over-the-counter decongestants, and subsequently developed a cough and an infiltrate on chest x-ray that did not respond to a course of antibiotics. He is admitted to the hospital for further workup and noted to have an elevated creatinine with dysmorphic red cells. A CT chest is shown. His renal failure progresses and he subsequently develops hemoptysis and requires intubation for hypoxemia. A bronchoscopy demonstrates findings consistent with diffuse hemorrhage, and the C anca returns positive at 1 to 640 with a positive proteinase 3. His creatinine is 6 mg per dil. Which of the following is the next best step in management? A. Corticosteroids and cyclophosphamide. B. Corticosteroids and rituximab. C. Plasmapheresis and corticosteroids. D. Plasmapheresis, corticosteroids, and cyclophosphamide. Or E. Plasmapheresis, corticosteroids, rituximab, and azathioprine. The answer is D. This patient has severe granulomatosis with polyangiitis GPA. The initial immunosuppressive regimen should include steroids in combination with cyclophosphamide or rituximab. Neither agent has been demonstrated to be clearly superior to the other in clinical trials. In addition, plasmapheresis should be considered for those with pulmonary hemorrhage or severe renal failure. While azathioprine is effective as a maintenance therapy, it has no role in initial immunosuppression. The key point is to identify appropriate treatment for severe GPA. Question four. A 45-year-old man with gastric cancer presents with worsening dyspnea. He initially presented six weeks ago with progressive weight loss and abdominal pain. He was found to have a large gastric mass and extensive intra-abdominal disease. He was lost to follow-up. On exam, he is tachycardic with a normal blood pressure. His respiratory rate is 22 and his oxygen saturation is 93% on two liters supplemental oxygen. His lungs are clear, his abdomen is soft, and he has one plus lower extremity edema. A CT angiogram shows clear lungs and is negative for pulmonary embolism. A lower extremity ultrasound is negative for deep venous thrombosis. Abdominal imaging demonstrates a moderate amount of ascites. An echocardiogram demonstrates a dilated hypokinetic right ventricle and elevated pulmonary pressures. Which of the following therapies is most likely to address the etiology of his dyspnea? A, intravenous unfractionated heparin. B, low molecular weight heparin. C, inferior vena cava filter. D, chemotherapy, and E, paracentesis. The answer is D. The presentation in this patient is most concerning for tumor emboli. Tumor emboli fall into several categories, including macroscopic disease, microscopic disease, and microvascular invasion. Tumor thrombotic microangiopathy is a related phenomenon. Microscopic tumor emboli, the most common presentation, has been reported in many malignancies, but appear to be the most common, sorry, but appears to be the most commonly due to adenocarcinomas of the breast and stomach. Patients often present with subacute dyspnea, though more rapid respiratory failure can be seen. A CT angiogram is insensitive for the diagnosis of tumor emboli. Ventilation perfusion scans may demonstrate small peripheral subsegmental defects. Some studies have also used PET scans. A definitive diagnosis can be made by lung biopsy showing tumor cells not contiguous with metastatic fo foci. Cytologic exam of an aspirate from a wedged pulmonary artery catheter may also be useful. Unfortunately, the prognosis from the disease is very poor. While studies have not specifically demonstrated the effectiveness of chemotherapy in tumor emboli, treatment of the underlying tumor is the only therapy of potential benefit in this case. Key point is to recognize tumor emboli syndrome. Question five. A 45-year-old female presents with gradually progressive dyspnea for several months accompanied by a non-productive cough. She is a non-smoker. Room air oxygen saturation is 93%. A CT scan is obtained. A sputum culture reveals a mem avium complex. The patient undergoes bronchoscopy with transbronchial biopsy and bronchial alveolar lavage, which is also positive for mem avium complex. The biopsy demonstrates alveoli filled with periodic acid shift PAS, positive granular material. 
Which of the following treatment options is not likely to be considered during this patient's management? Choice A, whole lung lavage. B, treatment with GMCSF. C, treatment with steroids. D, treatment for MAC based on culture sensitivities. Answer, C. The CT scan demonstrates diffuse ground glass opacities with interlobular septal thickening and polygonal shapes, also known as crazy paving. While all or nearly all patients with pulmonary alveolar proteinosis will have crazy paving, this finding is nonspecific and can be seen in a diverse set of etiologies, including pulmonary hemorrhage, drug-induced pneumonitis, bacterial pneumonia, adenocarcinoma, and edema. However, the biopsy demonstrating alveoli filled with periodic acid shift granular material is diagnostic. Bronchial alveolar lavage and transbronchial biopsy are usually sufficient to obtain the diagnosis. Whole lung lavage is the standard of therapy for those with moderate to severe dyspnea and hypoxemia. Many patients with PAP have antibodies to GMCSF, which may play a key role in pathogenesis. Subcutaneous injection or treatment with inhaled GMCSF may be beneficial. Small open label studies may have demonstrated a sustainable response in 35 to 75% of patients. GMCSF antibodies may interfere with differentiation of alveolar macrophages, which may explain why these patients have increased susceptibility to infection. These infections can include opportunistic organisms such as nocardio, mycobacteria, and fungi. Thus, it would be appropriate to treat this patient for MAC. There's no role for immunosuppressive agents. The key point here is to recognize PAP and understand treatment. Question six. A 35-year-old man presents to your office for follow-up. He recently was seen in the emergency department with sudden onset chest pain and dyspnea and was found to have a pneumothorax, which resolved with tube thoracostomy. He notes that his father and uncle have also had a pneumothorax. His exam is notable for dome-shaped, subtle whitish papules on his face. A CT scan demonstrates scattered lung cysts. Which of the following studies should be performed? A, thyroid ultrasound, B, lung biopsy, C, renal imaging, D, sequencing of the TSC1 and TSC2 genes, or E, none, no testing is indicated. The answer is C. This patient most likely has Berthog-Dubé syndrome. Berthog-Dubé is characterized by pulmonary cysts and pneumothorax, fibrofolliculomas of the skin, and renal cancer. It is due to mutations in the folliculin gene and transmitted in an autosomal dominant fashion. Due to a markedly elevated risk of renal cancer, screening is recommended. The diagnosis of BHD is increasingly based on genetic testing. Skin lesions, at least one histologically confirmed, is consistent with BHD, as well as lung cysts, renal cancer, and family history are also considerations. A lung biopsy is more invasive than a skin biopsy, and findings can be nonspecific. Mutations in the TSC1 and TSC2 genes can result in tuberous sclerosis, which is associated with lymphangiomyomatosis, skin findings, and angiomyolipomas. However, LAM is almost exclusively seen in women. The skin lesions associated with TSC, hypomelanotic macules, angiofibromas, chagrin patch, are not seen in this case, and TSC is also associated with brain lesions, cognitive defects, and ophthalmic manifestations. Key point is to recognize berthog dubé syndrome. Question seven. A 23-year-old man presents to clinic to initiate care. He has a diagnosis of common variable immunodeficiency but has not been seen by a physician in nearly a year and is on no therapy. Quantitative immunoglobulins are ordered and confirm the diagnosis. CT scan demonstrates nodular ground glass opacities. Which of the following therapies is most likely to be of benefit? A, corticosteroids. B, immunoglobulin. C, prophylactic antibiotics, or D, rituximab? The answer is B. CVID is characterized by impaired B cell differentiation and immunoglobulin production and is one of the most common immune deficiencies in adults. In some cases, specific genetic defects have been identified. In addition to recurrent bacterial infections, lung disease is common. And in addition to bronchiectasis, can include follicular bronchiolitis, lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, and granulomatous interstitial lung disease, or GLILD. 
Immunoglobulin is the primary treatment and reduces the number of pulmonary infections, use of antibiotics, and number of hospitalizations. It is also likely, particularly in higher doses, to improve progression in lung disease. Hematologic disorders are common in CVID, and corticosteroids and rituximab may be required, for example, for idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Prophylactic antibiotics may be useful in a patient with recurrent or chronic infections and would not have the benefits of IVIG. The key point is to describe the potential benefits of IVIG for CVID. Question eight. A 29-year-old female with rheumatoid arthritis is referred to pulmonary clinic after PPD testing revealed five millimeters of induration. Her rheumatologist is planning on starting a TNF alpha inhibitor. Which of the following treatment plans is appropriate? A, isoniazid and rifapentine for three months. B, rifampin or pyrazinamide daily for two months. C, repeat PPD six months after initiation of TNF alpha inhibitor. D, isoniazid weekly for six months. Or E, isoniazid twice weekly for three months. The answer is A. This woman's PPD is considered positive at five millimeters because her imminent immunosuppression with a TNF alpha inhibitor places her at the highest risk category. This category also includes HIV positive patients, recent contacts of active cases of pulmonary tuberculosis, and patients with evidence of old TB. Of the choices above, the best regimen is A, given weekly via directly observed therapy. Other standard treatment regimens include isoniazid daily for nine months, standard, daily for six months, alternate, twice weekly for six or nine months, alternate with directly observed therapy, isoniazid it and rifampin for three months or rifampin daily for four months. The combination of rifampin and pyrazinamide results in an increased risk of severe liver toxicity and death and is not recommended. The key point here is to know the guidelines for treatment of a positive PPD. Question nine. A 45-year-old man with hepatitis C cirrhosis presents with dyspnea. He has a history of esophageal varices treated with banding. His dyspnea had been attributed to ascites, but his dyspnea persisted after management with paracentesis, furosemide, and spironolactone. He notes that his dyspnea improves when he is lying down. His vital signs are notable for an oxygen saturation of 89% on room air, while supine that improves while sitting. His exam is otherwise only remarkable for stigmata of cirrhosis, including extensive spider nevi. An EKG and chest X-ray are normal. Which of the following is true about his condition? A, CT angiography will show small arteriovenous malformations. B, pulmonary vasodilators may be needed. C, liver transplantation should be given a higher priority. D, medical therapy stabilizes the course and a standard treatment. E, supplemental oxygen is unlikely to improve his oxygenation. The answer is C. Respiratory disorders that occur concomitantly with liver disease include diseases that share a common underlying condition, for example, cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, physiologic abnormalities, restriction from massive ascites, respiratory alkalosis, hepatic hydrothorax, portopulmonary hypertension, and hepatopulmonary syndrome. Hepatopulmonary syndrome is typically caused by intravascular pulmonary dilations, or IVPDs, which are often basilar in location and result in the classic, though not pathognomonic, symptoms of platypnea and findings of ortho orthodeoxia. In contrast to true arterial venous malformations, IVPDs are microscopic and not seen on CT angiography and do not result in true stunt physiology. Diagnosis is typically by contrast-enhanced echocardiogram. Portopulmonary hypertension is another important consideration in the setting of hypoxemia in a clear chest x-ray. However, it is not typically associated with platypnea, and there are no secondary findings suggesting pulmonary hypertension. Liver transplantation is the only curative therapy and should be prioritized for patients with this condition. Small case reports have found variable and transient improvements with a variety of agents, but data is insufficient to support their use. The key point here is to recognize and manage hepatopulmonary syndrome. Question 10. A 35-year-old woman at 30 weeks gestation develops acute appendicitis and undergoes an appendectomy. 
The surgery is uncomplicated and she is extubated. She reports that her pain is well controlled. Which one of the following sets of values from blood gas is consistent with a normal pregnancy? A, 7.33, 4890. B, 7.36, 44 and 106. C, 7.39, 41 and 104. D, 7.43, 31 and 100. Or E, 7.52, 25 and 85. The answer is D. Expected physiologic changes of pregnancy are primarily due to an increase in progesterone, which increases respiratory drive, and an upward shift in the diaphragm due to the enlarging fetus. These result in an increased in tidal volume, a decrease in functional residual capacity, expiratory reserve volume, residual volume, and a slight decrease in total lung capacity. Forced expiratory volume generally does not change. The PaCO2 in pregnancy generally decreases to approximately 30 millimeters of mercury, and with normal increase in bicarbonate excretion from the kidneys, results in a mildly alkalemic pH, generally between 7.4 to 7.45. The key point here is to recognize expected physiologic changes in pregnancy. Question 11. A 35-year-old man from Indiana presents with facial and upper extremity swelling that is worse after lifting weights or vigorous exercise. He is a one-pack-a-day smoker and works in construction and demolition of old homes. His past medical history is notable for idiopathic pericarditis. His exam is notable for extensive venous collaterals on the anterior chest wall. A CT of the chest reveals a soft tissue infiltrative abnormality in the mediastine with areas of dense calcification. Which organism is the likely cause of his disease? A, blastomyces. B, coccidioides. C, cryptococcus. D, histoplasma, or E, mycobacterium tuberculosis. The answer is D. The majority of cases of fibrosing mediastinitis are thought to be due to an excessive host response to infection with histoplasma capsulatum, a dimorphic fungus associated with soil contaminated with bird or bat droppings. While most prevalent geographically in the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys, cases have been reported in other locations. Other less common etiologies include mediastinal radiation, infection with other organisms, including tuberculosis and blastomyces, and idiopathic cases. A biopsy is not required to confirm the diagnosis and carries a risk of hemorrhage. The key point here is to recognize the clinical presentation and etiology of fibrosing mediastinitis. Question 12. A 55-year-old man presents with dyspnea. He has not seen a physician in several years. He is obese and a 40-pack year active smoker. His chest x-ray demonstrates a moderate right-sided pleural fusion. An ultrasound-guided thoracentesis with pleural manometry is performed. His initial pleural pressure was negative 2 centimeters of water and decreases to negative 22 centimeters of water after 300 cc's of fluid is removed, at which point the patient reports some chest discomfort. The procedure is terminated. Fluid protein and LDH are consistent with a transudate. Cytology and microbiologic studies are negative. A chest CT scan demonstrates a thickened pleura and a hydropneumothorax. Which of the following diagnoses is most likely? A, procedure-related pneumothorax. B, trapped lung. C, bronchopleural fistula. D, lung entrapment. And E, re-expansion pulmonary edema. The answer is B. Lung that does not expand, unexpandable lung, can be due to extrapleural causes, such as endobronchial obstruction, or pleural causes, namely lung entrapment and trapped lung. Lung entrapment refers to a failure of the lung to expand in a setting of an active inflammatory or malignant process, and is typically characterized by an initial set of pleural pressures consistent with an expandable lung, e.g. initially positive with a normal elastance, followed by rapidly dropping pressures indicative of an increasingly stiff pleura. In contrast, trapped lung may result from a more distant insult without current active inflammation and is characterized by initial often negative pleural pressure with a steep increase in elastance. Fluid can be transudative or exudative. While procedure-related pneumothorax and bronchopleural fistula are possible, they are less likely given the pleural pressure findings. Re-expansion pulmonary edema is unlikely given the small amount of fluid removed and minimal change in pleural pressure. The key point here is to recognize the clinical characteristics of trapped lung. Question 13. 
A 55-year-old woman presents with a hoarse voice and persistent cough. Two months ago, she presented with hemoptysis and a cavitary lung lesion and was diagnosed with tuberculosis and started on four drug therapy. Her hemoptysis and initial dyspnea improved. She is from China, has asthma, and an anxiety disorder, and is an active smoker. Pulmonary function tests show the following. Which is the most likely diagnosis? A, vocal cord dysfunction, B, tracheal stenosis, C, tracheomalacia, or D, tuberculoma? The answer is B. Pulmonary function tests reveal a fixed airway obstruction. Given the history, the most likely diagnosis is tracheal stenosis. Vocal cord paralysis or vocal cord dysfunction would most likely demonstrate findings consistent with a variable extrathoracic lesion with flattening of the inspiratory limb. Tracheomalacia would likely show an expiratory limitation consistent with a variable intrathoracic obstruction. A tuberculoma refers to a rounded pulmonary lesion and should not result in fixed airway obstruction. While laryngeal tuberculosis is rare, in this patient with a history of TB, the most likely cause of her obstruction is TB involving her trachea and larynx. The key point is to identify fixed airway obstruction. Question 14. Which of the following is not a risk factor for diffuse alveolar hemorrhage? A. Allogeneic... <laughs> A allogeneic stem cell transplant, B, positive ANCA, C, propothiouracil, D, positive ANA, and E, bleomycin. The answer is E. Diffuse alveolar hemorrhage is characterized by bleeding into the alveolar space as a, re as a result of disruption of the alveolar capillary membrane. DH is a set of syndromes primarily differentiated by the underlying process. An active catheritis can be due to ANCA-associated vasculitis, autoimmune disorders such as lupus or stem cell transplant. While DAH is more commonly associated with autologous transplants, allogeneic transplants are also a risk factor for DAH. Causes of bland hemorrhage include good pastures syndrome and mitral stenosis. Finally, diffuse alveolar damage can also result in DAH. Several medications can result in DAH through one of the three mechanisms, one of these three mechanisms, including PTU, amiodarone, antiplatelet agents, and serolimus. Bleomycin has been associated with fibrosis, but not with hemorrhage. The key point is to recognize etiologies of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage syndrome. Question 15. A 55-year-old man is two years status post a single lung transplant for COPD. His history is notable for an episode of CMV pneumonitis three months post transplant, and an episode of biopsy diagnosed acute rejection at four months. He suffers from significant reflux despite maximal medical therapy. He presents with progressive dyspnea over the past four months with an FEV1 that has dropped 30% from his best post-transplant lung function. Which of the following does not represent a risk factor for the development of bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, or BOS? A, CMV pneumonitis. B, primary graft dysfunction. C, gastroesophageal reflux disease. D, acute rejection, or E, COPD. The answer is E. Bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, BOS, is the major form of chronic rejection and chronic lung allograft dysfunction, or CLAD, in lung transplant, and the major cause of morbidity and mortality after the first year. Grade 1 and higher BOS is traditionally defined as a reduction of FEV1 of greater than 20% of the baseline in absence of other known cause. Reported risk factors include CMV pneumonitis, primary graft dysfunction, development of donor-specific antibodies, respiratory infection, GERD, and a history of acute rejection. The pre-transplant diagnosis is generally not associated with BOS. The key point is to recognize potential risk factors for BOS. Question 16. A 64-year-old woman with no prior history of lung disease presents with one year of worsening dyspnea with cough and wheezing. She has been treated with antibiotics as well as a prednisone taper without improvement. She is a prior 10-pack year smoker. On exam, her vital signs are normal and her chest demonstrates mild expiratory wheezing. A chest x-ray de demonstrates a pulmonary nodule. A CT scan identifies a lesion and bronchoscopic biopsy is consistent with carcinoid. Which of the following statements is true? 
A, adjuvant therapy is required for localized disease. B, the majority of carcinoids arise in the proximal airways. C, 50% of patients present with carcinoid syndrome. D, typical survival is poor, 50%, less than 50% at five years. And E, most patients with liver disease have carcinoid syndrome. The answer is B. Most carcinoids, a term used to denote well-differentiated neurocrindum tumors, or NETs, are relatively centrally located. A minority present as a peripheral pulmonary nodule. The vast majority are typical, do not recur, and are associated with excellent over -survi overall survival of 90%. Wheezing, cough, and hemoptysis are common presentations, although approximately 30% are asymptomatic. Surgical resection offers the best chance for cure. Adjuvant therapy may be needed for histologically aggressive or residual disease. Locally advanced disease is poorly responsive to chemotherapy or radiation. Carcinoid syndrome is uncommon even in the presence of metastatic disease, but can occur. Rarely bronchial carcinoids can produce ACTH or GHRH. The key point here is to know the presentation of carcinoid tumors. Question 17. A 55-year-old man presents with several months of numbness and a burning sensation in his hands and feet. He also reports constipation. His motor exam is normal. His past medical history is notable only for hypertension. He is a 100-pack year current smoker. He undergoes a chest CT and a PET scan. Which of the following is correct regarding his diagnosis? A, this disease occurs primarily in non-smokers. B, the neurologic disease is unlikely to be related to his malignancy. C, anti-WHO antibodies are associated with this syndrome. D, the usual presentation of the disease is of a peripheral mass. Or E, the five-year survival is greater than 40%. The answer is C. The CT and PET scans demonstrate PET-positive right hilar and subcranial lymph nodes without parenchymal abnormalities. The most likely diagnosis is small cell lung cancer with a neurologic perineoplastic syndrome. Lung cancers are the most common cause of neurologic perineoplastic syndromes, the most common of which is Lambert-Eaton syndrome. However, there are many others, including necrotizing myelopathy, cerebral encephalopathy, and peripheral neuropathy. These syndromes are thought to be mediated by antibodies from an immune response against a tumor expressing neuronal antigen. Of the identified onconeural antibodies, the most common is the anti-WHO antibody. While the presence of these antibodies suggests a better tumor prognosis, the five-year survival rate for limited stage small cell lung cancer is still well below 40%. The key point here is to be familiar with perineoplastic syndromes associated with small cell lung cancer. Question 18. A 30-year-old pregnant woman with asthma presents with worsening dyspnea. Prior to her pregnancy, she was maintained on an as-needed albuterol inhaler, which she used rarely. She was recently prescribed budesonide in the setting of daily albuterol use and nocturnal awakenings. Two weeks later, she no longer has nocturnal symptoms, but she still requires daily use of albuterol. The next most reasonable step is A, add a long-acting beta agonist, B, double her steroid inhaler dose. C, add oral steroids. D, continue the current regimen. Or E, either A or B. The answer is E. Pregnant women with symptoms at least two days a week require controller therapy for their asthma. The initial medication of choice is a low dose inhaled glucocorticoid. Available data support the use of budesonide, class B, Although other inhaled steroids are likely safe, the data is not available, class C. For women who are not well controlled on low-dose steroids, increasing the dose of inhaled steroid or adding a long-acting beta agonist are reasonable options. The key point is to know the management of asthma in pregnancy. Question 19. A 22-year-old woman with cystic fibrosis presents to your clinic. 
She brings reports of her prior sputum microbiologic studies. Which of the following bacterial pathogens has not been shown to affect mortality in patients with cystic fibrosis? A, MRSA, B, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, B, Burkholderia sanosepatia, D, Burkholderia dolosa, or E, Stenotrophomonas. The answer is E. Chronic bacterial infection occurs in most patients with cystic fibrosis, but the age of acquisition and the types of organisms cultured varies between patients. Cystic fibrosis airways appear to be particularly susceptible to pseudomonas, and chronic infection has been associated with a higher mortality. The negative effects of Burkholderia, formerly known as pseudomonas, cepatia complex, have also been well described. Burkholderia cepatia, gemovirus senosepatia and delosa may carry particularly poor prognosis. A recent study also demonstrated an increased risk for mortality in carriers of MRSA. While Stenotrophomonas is a resistant organism, often colonized from patients with advanced CF, it has not been associated with increased mortality. The key point here is to recognize bacteria associated with worse prognosis in cystic fibrosis. Question 20. An 80-year-old woman is admitted to the hospital from a nursing home. Her past medical history includes hypothyroidism, coronary artery disease, and gastroesophageal reflux, and she is on levothyroxine, simvastatin, aspirin, metoprolol, and pentoprazole. Two weeks ago, she was hospitalized with a hip fracture and was treated for a urinary tract infection. Her symptoms include cough productive of green sputum and mild confusion. On physical exam, her temperature is 99.4 Fahrenheit, heart rate 101 beats per minute, respiratory rate 32 breaths per minute, and blood pressure 90 over 40 millimeters of mercury. Her chest x-ray demonstrates bilateral lower lobe infiltrates. Which of the following antibiotic regimens is the best choice for treating this patient? A, ceftriaxone and azithromycin, B, gentamicin and linazolid and azithromycin. C, ceftriaxone and vancomycin and metronidazole. D, dorpenem, ciprofloxacin and vancomycin. Or E, piperacillin, tazobactam and levofloxacin and vancomycin. The answer is E. This patient has a healthcare associated pneumonia and is at risk for multi drug resistant organisms. Without further specific knowledge regarding the prevalence of resistance, her regimen should cover resistant gram-negative organisms, particularly pseudomonas, as well as MRSA. Use of two anti-pseudomonal agents may not be optimal in patients with few risk factors for drug resistance, but this patient has had a recent hospitalization, has received antibiotics, is non-ambulatory, and uses gastric acid-suppressing medications, making resistance more likely. Coverage specifically targeting atypicals is unnecessarily. Likewise, specific anaerobic coverage is generally not necessary in hospital-acquired infections, and regardless, piperacillin and tazobactam would cover most anaerobes. Doripenem has not been approved for pneumonia, and a study in ventilator-associated pneumonia showed increased mortality versus imipenem. The key point is to recognize treatment for healthcare-associated pneumonia. This slide shows the references for these questions.